Hello, my darling, and welcome to today's story time. If you like what you hear, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And now, on with our story time. Chapter 6 The Marriage of King Arthur and Queen Guinevere and the Founding of the Round Table The Adventure of Hart and Hound It befell upon a certain day that King Arthur said to Merlin, My lords and knights do daily pray me now to take a wife, but I will have none without thy counsel, for thou hast ever helped me since I came first to this crown. It is well, said Merlin, that thou shouldst take a wife, for no man of bounteous and noble nature should live without one. But is there any lady whom thou lovest better than another? Yes, said King Arthur, I love Guinevere, the daughter of King Leodegrance of Camelgard, who also holdeth in his house the round table that he had from my father, Uther, and, as I think, that damsel is the gentlest and fairest lady living. Sir, answered Merlin, as for her beauty, she is one of the fairest that do live, but if ye had not loved her as ye do, I would fain have had ye choose some other who is both fair and good. But where a man's heart is set, he will be loath to leave. This Merlin said, knowing the misery that should hereafter happen from this marriage. Then King Arthur sent word to King Leodegrance that he mightily desired to wed his daughter, and how that he had loved her since he saw her first when with king's ban and boars he rescued Leo de Grants from King Rance of North Wales. When King Leo de Grants heard the message, he cried out, These be the best tidings I have heard in all my life. So great and worshipful a prince to seek my daughter for his wife. I would fain give him half my lands with her straight away, but he needeth none and better will it please him that I send him the round table of King Uther, his father, with a hundred good knights towards the furnishing of it with guests, for he will soon find means to gather more and make the table full. Then King Leodegrance delivered his daughter Guinevere to the messengers of King Arthur, and also the round table with the hundred knights. So they rode royally and freshly, sometimes by water and sometimes by land, towards Camelot. And as they rode along in the spring weather, they made full many sports and pastimes. And in all those sports and games, a young knight lately came to Arthur's court. Sir Lancelot, by name, was passing strong and won praise from all, being full of grace and hardihood, and Guinevere also ever looked on him with joy, and always in the eventide, when the tents were set beside some stream or forest, many minstrels came and sang before the knights and ladies as they sat in the tent doors, and many knights would tell adventures, and still, Sir Lancelot was foremost, and told the knightliest tales, and sang the godliest songs of all the company. And when they came to Camelot, King Arthur made great joy, and all the city with him, and riding forth with a great retinue, he met Guinevere and her company, and led her through the streets all filled with people and in the midst of all their shoutings and the ringing of church bells, 
to a palace hard by his own. Then, in all haste, the king commanded to prepare the marriage and the coronation with the stateliest and most honorable pomp that could be made. And when the day was come, the archbishops led the king to the cathedral, whereto he walked, clad in his royal robes, and having four kings, bearing four golden swords before him, a choir of passing sweet music, going also with him. In another part was the queen dressed in her richest ornaments, and led by archbishops and bishops to the chapel of the virgins. The four queens, also of the four kings last mentioned, walked before her, bearing four white doves, according to ancient custom, and after her there followed many damsels, singing and making every sign of joy. And when the two processions were come to the churches, so wondrous was the music and the singing, that all the knights and barons who were there pressed on each other, as in the crowd of battle, to hear and see the most they might. When the king was crowned, he called together all the knights that came at the round table from Camelgard, and twenty-eight others, great and valiant men, chosen by Merlin out of all the realm, towards making up the full number of the table. Then the Archbishop of Canterbury blessed the seats of all the knights, and when they rose again, therefrom to pay their homage to King Arthur, there was found upon the back of each knight's seat his name, written in letters of gold. But upon one seat was found written, This is the siege perilous, wherein if any man shall sit, save him whom heaven hath chosen, he shall be devoured by fire. Anon came young Gawain, the king's nephew, praying to be made a knight, whom the king knighted then and there. Soon after came a poor man, leading with him a tall, fair lad of eighteen years of age, riding on a lean mare. And falling at the king's feet, the poor man said, Lord, it was told me that at this time of thy marriage thou wouldst give to any man the gift he asked for so it were not unreasonable. That is the truth, replied King Arthur, and I will make it good. Thou sayest graciously and nobly, said the poor man. Lord, I ask nothing else but that thou wilt make my son here a knight. It is a great thing that thou asked, said the king. What is thy name? Ares, answered he. Cometh this prayer from thee, or from thy son? inquired King Arthur. Nay, Lord, not from myself, said he, but from him only, for I have thirteen other sons, and all of them will fall to any labor that I put them to. But this one will do no such work for anything that I or my wife may do, but is for ever shooting or fighting and running to see knights and joustings, and torments me, both night and day, that he be made a knight. And what is thy name? said the king to the young man. My name is Tor, said he. Then the king, looking at him steadfastly, was well pleased with his face and figure, and with his look of nobleness and strength. Fetch all thy other sons before me, said the king to Ares. But when he brought them, none of them resembled Tor in size or shape or feature. Then the king knighted Tor, saying, Be thou to thy life's end a good knight and a true, as I pray God thou mayest be. And if thou provest worthy and of prowess, one day, Thou shalt be counted in the round table. Then, turning to Merlin, Arthur said, Prophecy now, O Merlin, shall Sir Tor become a worthy knight or not? Yes, Lord, said Merlin, so he ought to be, 
for he is the son of that King Pellinore, whom thou hast met, and proved to be one of the best knights living. He is not this cowherd's son. Presently after came in King Pellinore, and when he saw Sir Tor, he knew him for his son, and was more pleased than words can tell to find him knighted by the king. And Pellinore did homage to King Arthur, and was gladly and graciously accepted of the king, and then was led by Merlin to a high seat at the table round, near to the perilous seat. But Sir Gawain was full of anger at the honor done King Pellinore, and said to his brother Gaheris, He slew our father, King Lot, therefore will I slay him. Do it, not yet, said he. Wait till I also become a knight, then will I help ye in it. It is best ye suffer him to go at this time, and do not trouble this high feast with bloodshed. As ye will be it, then, said Sir Gawain. Then rose the king, and spake to all the table round, and charged them to be ever true and noble knights, to do neither outrage nor murder, nor any unjust violence, and always to flee treason, also by no means ever to be cruel, but give mercy unto him that asked for mercy, upon pain of forfeiting the liberty of his court for evermore. Moreover, at all times, on pain of death, to give all succor unto ladies and young damsels, and lastly, never to take part in any wrongful quarrel for reward or payment. And to all this he swore them, night by night. Then he ordained, that every year at Pentecost they should all come before him, wheresoever he might appoint a place, and give account of all their doings and adventures of the past twelve months. And so, with prayer and blessing, and high words of cheer, he instituted the most noble order of the round table, whereto the best and bravest knights in all the world sought afterwards to find admission. Then was the high feast made ready, and the king and queen sat side by side before the entire assembly, and great and royal was the banquet and the pomp. And as they sat, each man in his place, Merlin went round and said, Sit still a while, for ye shall see a strange and marvellous adventure. So as they sat, there suddenly came running through the hall a white hart, with a white hound next after him, and thirty couple of black running hounds, making full cry, and the hart made a circuit of the table round, and passed the other tables, and suddenly the white hound flew upon him, and bit him fiercely, and tore a piece out of his haunch, whereat the heart sprang suddenly with a great leap, and overthrew a knight sitting at the table, who rose forthwith, and, taking up the hound, mounted, and rode fast away. But no soon had he left, than there came a lady mounted on a white palfrey, who cried out to the king, Lord, suffer me not to have this injury. The hound is mine, which the knight taketh. And as she spake, a knight rode in all armed on a great horse, and suddenly took up the lady, and rode away with her by force. Then the king desired Sir Gawain, Sir Tor, and King Pellinore to mount and follow this adventure to the uttermost, and told Sir Gawain to bring back the heart. Sir Tor the hound and knight, and King Pellinore the knight and the lady. So Sir Gawain rode forth at a swift pace, and with him Gaheris, his brother, for a squire. And as they went, they saw two knights fighting on horseback, and when they reached them, they divided them 
and asked the reason of their quarrel. We fight for a foolish matter, one replied, for we be brethren. But there came by a white heart this way, chased by many hounds, and thinking it was an adventure for the high feast of King Arthur, I would have followed it to have gained worship, whereat my younger brother, here, declared he was the better knight, and would go after it instead. And so we fight to prove which of us is the better knight. This is indeed a foolish thing, said Sir Gawain. Fight with all strangers, if ye will, but not brother with brother. Take my advice, set on against me, and if ye yield to me, as I shall do my best to make ye, ye shall go to King Arthur, and yield to his grace. Sir Knight, replied the brothers, we are weary, and will do thy wish without encountering thee. But by whom shall we tell the king that we were sent? By the knight that followeth the quest of the white heart, said Sir Gawain. And now tell me your names, and let us part. Sorlis and Brian of the forest, they replied. And so they went their way to the king's court. No sooner had he spoken, when there came out suddenly four knights, well armed, and assailed them hard, saying to Sir Gawain, Thou new-made knight, how hast thou shamed thy knighthood? A knight without mercy is dishonored. Shamed thee evermore. Then were the brothers in great jeopardy, and fear for their lives. For they were but two to four, and weary with traveling and one of the four knights shot Sir Gawain with a bolt, and hit him through the arm, so that he could fight no more. But when there was nothing left for him but death, there came four ladies forth, and prayed the four knights' mercy for the strangers. So they gave Sir Gawain and Gaheris their lives, and made them and the brothers yield themselves prisoners. On the morrow, came one of the ladies to Sir Gawain, and talked with him, saying, Sir Knight, what cheer? Not good, said he. It is your own default, sir, said the lady, for we know you killed that damsel yesterday, and ever shall it be great shame to you, but ye be not of King Arthur's kin. Yes, truly I am, said he. My name is Gawain son of King Lot of Orkney, whom King Pellinore slew, and my mother, Felicent, his half-sister to the king. When the lady heard this, she went, and presently got leave for him to quit the castle, and they gave him the head of the white heart, which had come into their employ, to take with him, because it was in his quest. So in that fashion, he rode back to Camelot, and when the king and queen saw him, and heard tell of his adventures, they were heavily displeased, and, by the order of the queen, he was put upon his trial before a court of ladies, who judged him to be, evermore, for all his life, the knight of the ladies' quarrels, and to fight always on their side, and never against any also they charged him never to refuse mercy to him that asked it, and swore him to it on the holy gospels. And thus ended the adventure of the white heart. King Pellinore had pursued the lady whom the knight had seized away from the wedding feast, and as he rode through the woods, he saw in a valley a fair young damsel sitting by a well-side, and a wounded knight lying in her arms. King Pellinore saluted her as he passed by. As soon as she perceived him, she cried out, Help me, help me, knight. But Pellinore was far too eager in his quest to stay or turn, although she cried a hundred times to him for help, at which she prayed to heaven he might have such sore need before he died as she had now and presently thereafter her knight died in her arms, and she, 
for grief and love, slew herself with his sword. But King Pellinore rode on until he met a poor man, and asked him, had he seen a knight pass this way, leading by force a lady with him? But then he looked around, and he saw behind him the lady that was on his quest, and with her the two squires of the two knights who fought. Fair lady, said he, ye must come with me unto Arthur's court. Sir knight, said the two squires, yonder be two knights fighting for this lady. Go part them, and get their consent to take her. Ye say well, said King Pellinore, and rode between the combatants, and asked them why they fought. Sir knight, said one, yon lady is my cousin, mine aunt's daughter, whom I met, borne away against her will, by this knight here. I therefore fight to free her. Sir knight, replied the other, this lady got I, by my arms and prowess, at King Arthur's court today. That is false, said King Pellinore. He stole the lady suddenly, and fled away with her, before any knight could arm to stay thee. But it is my service to take her back again. Neither of ye shall therefore have her. But if ye will fight for her, fight with me now, and here. But both knights refused. The one said, Take my cousin, the lady, with thee, as thy quest is. But as thou art a true knight, suffer her to come to neither shame nor harm. So the next day King Pellinore departed for Camelot, and took the lady with him. Then he heard two knights meet and salute each other in the dark, one riding from Camelot, the other from the north. What tidings at Camelot? said one. By my head, said the other. I have just leapt there, and I have spied King Arthur's court, and such fellowship is there as never may be broke or overcome, for well nigh all the chivalry of the world is there, and all full loyal to the king. And now I ride back homewards to the north to tell our chiefs that they waste not their strength in wars against him. Beware, said the first knight, of Merlin, for he knoweth all things by the devil's craft. I do not fear for that, replied the other, and he rode on his way. And so he bore the lady to Camelot, to the court, and met with Merlin, who praised him, for great treachery was afoot on this quest. And this, my darling, ends our story time for today. As always, I hope that you have very sweet and creepy dreams.